cases. What is yours? Yeah, so as Dr. Killen said, my name is Kristen Patnam, and I'll be presenting on charge transfer between a perovskite <coughs> semiconductor and electronic subpoena titanium dioxide agents. First, here I just have an image for you guys of the three dimensional perovskite and then the one dimensional projection. I'll speak a little bit on how we got the three dimensional image into a one dimensional projection in just a second. But just to familiarize yourselves with what this perovskite looks like in the MATLAB produced plots, you'll be seeing this throughout the rest of the plots in my entire presentation. <coughs> So in order to first get that 3D image into a one-dimensional uh, projection, we had to collapse our three-dimensional potential into a one-dimensional potential. Um, to do this, you apply a double integral in order to remove the two uh, dimensions that we're not going to be using. And then we have normalization factor as well. Our potential is described um, with relationship to our electric field, which is that capital E, um, which is going to be our main variable throughout, where that mu is just a constant. Our Hamiltonian is going to be used as well in order to uh, tell you our evolution operator. And so that Hamiltonian is also dependent on our potential. So we're going to notice a dependence of, of um, our probability of finding the electron in a specific space is going to be dependent on our applied potential. Um, that's because our evolution operator is dependent on that Hamiltonian, which is dependent on the potential. And so I just have a further explanation uh, to outline or identify that each different potential is going to correspond to a different electric field, um, which is just important to note. And you'll notice that in the plots, we do see a direct relationship between um, our change in potential and our electric field. Furthermore, in order to get a rate to determine how our electron is moving in and out of the perovskite semiconductor, we choose an eigenstate and then run our code initially. And then from that, we're going to plot a graph that's going to show us the population of the of electrons in our actual accepting agent versus in the semiconductor as a function of time and the rate of population we gain. And then in order to extract the rate from that, we'll do a derivative over time and convert that into um, a rate in picoseconds or inverse picoseconds. Here I have about one picosecond just to describe if you have an excited electron, you notice that at excitation orbitals about seven to nine, the rate of transition from electron in the semiconductor to the TiO2 agent was about one inverse picosecond. Um, it's predicted that at an excitation, without excitation of the electron, that rate will be close to zero. So here I have an image to demonstrate what looks, what happens when you have a non-excited, non-excited electron versus an excited electron in the perovskite semiconductor. Without exciting the electron and without applying a field there's not much movement in the electron. These are static images, I'll point that out right now. Um, but once you excite that electron, we see that it's almost impossible to predict where that electron would be as the probability of it existing in any point of the semiconductor or the TiO2 agent um, is almost the same. And so it would be impossible to determine where it is in that system. So then to give a few videos of what this looks like when we have no applied field and our initial eigenstate at no excitation, we're going to see the electron move. And then when we excite the electron, not much is going to change in that motion. You'll see some differences in intensity, but it's unlikely that the electron is going to move in or out of that semiconductor. However, once we start to apply fields here, I have just a demonstration of um, potential versus, excuse me, um, this is all those colored lines are eigenstates for each respective potential. Um, just to demonstrate what we're going to do, we're going to start at an initial eigenstate of ground, a ground eigenstate, and then excite it up to about seven or nine. And so in the middle is where we have no applied field, which is what we just looked at. And then we have both a negative and a positive field. And we're going to look at how those affect the electron's motion differently. So first, if you apply a positive field and you're at no excitation of the electron, the electron has a hard time moving outside of the semiconductor. To remind you, this middle section is our semiconductor, and then as we move this way, we get to our titanium dioxide accepting agent. So then once we excite the electron, here we've excited to a state of nine, we see a lot more motion of the electron, and it actually makes its way outside of the semiconductor and even starts to populate that accepting agent. So then just to remind you, we're moving on to then apply a negative field and again, we're going to start at an initial ground state without exciting the electron. 
and then we'll excite the electrons again to a state of about nine. And once again, we see that almost static electron inside the semiconductor. And then as we apply um, excitation, you notice the movement of the electron. And in this case, we actually saw even more motion towards the left side of the semiconductor, which I thought was interesting. That's just, um, that, is, that left side is not our accepting agent. So further research would have to be done into why that happens. Also be interesting to do further work on optimizing photo excitation of the electron to see the most beneficial state of excitation um, to move that electron into your desired acceptor. And with that, I think, question. Okay, good, thank you.